Hello and welcome to another Truth Loader live debate. It's Thursday, it's 7 p.m. Sorry, I've done it again. My laptop turned off. It's 7 p.m. so we are live. We have a great panel of people together today. We're going to be discussing the question, can we govern ourselves with digital technology? This is an interactive debate, so if you want to post a question or a comment, you can do that by leaving a comment on the YouTube video, or you can post a tweet or a Google Plus to the hashtag DigiGov. So why are we having this debate? Well, in late 2011, people gathered at Wall Street in New York in a global demonstration of discontent, and the message wasn't always clear from the movement, but people were clearly upset with the status quo and were very motivated to make a difference. And a new kind of democracy emerged. General assemblies were set up, which worked through new and sometimes strange looking system of waving hands but people were beginning to experiment with new kinds of democratic system and if nothing else occupy was a demonstration of democratic and political creativity and it remains a powerful idea to this day it demonstrated this during hurricane sandy that digital technology could be used to effectively facilitate a relief effort here on truth loader we did a piece about the occupy relief effort in which an amazon wish list was used to crowd purchase things for relief efforts. So are we beginning to see perhaps the beginnings of a flowing direct digital democracy? And following the financial crisis, which in one way or another was responsible for the birth of Occupy, the island of Iceland took a different route to many other countries and decided not to bail out the banks. And on October 20th last year, Iceland took another bold step that set it apart from other nations. The island wrote a constitution with the help of crowdsourcing. Are some of those ideas from the Occupy movement of direct participation and so on now filtering through into our politics? Could they replace our politics? At the heart of many people's frustrations, isn't it fair enough to say, are the banks. The bailouts and the bonuses have only served to make that reputation worse. Well, this week, a digitally powered currency made headlines, Bitcoin. A peer-to-peer -peer currency reached $20 per coin and caused some commentators including Bloomberg, to suggest that perhaps the homogeny of centralized banking may also be undermined by digital technology. So we have a great panel of guests with us today to discuss these ideas, which are all, as we know, brand new. We have with us from Iceland, Birgitta John Stotter. She's an Icelandic MP and WikiLeaks activist. She's currently trying to push through a crowdsourced constitution in the Icelandic parliament. We have Gavin Anderson. He's the lead developer for Bitcoin, the, bit, the currency which made headlines this week. It's a decentralized digital currency. We've got Dr. John Parkinson. Uh, John Parkinson is the associate Percep professor sorry, of public policy at the University of Warwick. We've got Mark Johnson, who's from The Economist. He's an internet and society correspondent where he writes about technology, politics, and international affairs. And we have Nomi Colvin. Nomi's a campaigner and an organiser who has been heavily involved in the London Occupy movement. She's currently involved in a project to increase participation in the City of London. So if you have any questions for our panel, tweet them at DigiGov, uh, the hashtag DigiGov, or leave them on the YouTube uh, video and we will try to get those read out. If possible, Nomi, I'd like to start with you and ask the sure. question as we started with Occupy. The Occupy movement was a response to something. People were clearly frustrated. What do you think that was? It's a response to a number of things, though. Obviously, I don't suppose I said Occupy was a problem. Nomi, Hello? sorry, can I just interrupt you? This, the sound of your microphone, I, I believe, is perhaps blocked. So, if we could go to Birgitta, okay. um, just while you try and solve that problem, we'll come back to you. Birgitta, um, maybe talk us through this incorrect, I, I'm fascinated by this story, the crowdsourced constitution of Iceland. It seems an incredible thing. Maybe you could give uh, the people watching at home a succinct explanation about why it's so important and why it's so new and different. All right. Uh, I'm really happy to be on this show uh, with all these brilliant people. Um, so, first of all, we had sort of the first Occupy uh, uh, protests in Iceland uh, that was nicknamed the Pots and Pans Revolution we were inspired by the Argentinians and we had four demands during these protests. One was to get rid of the central bank, uh, ahead of the central bank, one was to get ahead of the uh, financial regulatory authority, one was to get rid of the government 
and the fourth was to write a constitution by and for the people of Iceland. And uh, so we got, we have achieved the three of these things, uh, and uh, we are still working on the fourth. Uh, but the process of the new constitution, because there were such loud demands from the people outside the parliament protesting, uh, all the parties except the uh, independence party, the sort of neocon Tea Party of Iceland, that is, by the way, the biggest party in Iceland and that have been ruling for 18 years, it's non stop. Uh, were for these changes uh, and for this process. So the first step was actually to call together a gathering of 1,000 people that were randomly selected from the National Registry to come together for a weekend and discuss in a sort of a World Cafe scenario what were the elements that were the most important to be in the new constitution, what are our values, because a constitution it's not just a legal text, it is the social agreement on what sort of society we choose to be. And from this gathering uh, and uh, a group of experts uh, that the parliament uh, nominated to be in a sort of a constitutional committee, uh, the groundwork for the, to be the constitutional parliament uh, was laid. Uh, and uh, so we decided to, uh, the parliament decided to call for uh, uh, anybody to run for the constitutional parliament. And uh, we ran into slight problems because uh, so many people wanted to run. There were like 512 people and nobody was prepared really for it. So the introduction to all these individuals became both uh, too slow, too late, uh, and too complicated for many people and that I think is one of the reasons uh, so few people turned up to vote for them. Uh, and we ran into all sorts of glitches and difficulties because we're doing this for the first time and it is important to remember that whenever a nation does experimentation with their society there will always be mistakes and there will always be difficulties and it's never easy because the powers that are are not willing to let go of it. Uh, anyway, so we finally got this through uh, and uh, after a series of difficulties are too complex to go into. Uh, but um, And they did something really beautiful. So we elected 25 people and they had uh, way too short time, unfortunately, to do their work. But they still managed to open up the entire process. So you, anybody could actually send in comments. Uh, and they decided, because like 90% of Icelanders live on Facebook, uh, to uh, open the comment system in such a way that people could actually just uh, log in through the Facebook account and uh, put forward some suggestions on improvement or what they felt was still missing. And uh, they also, you could also do it through regular process by email and stuff like that, uh, or write to the committee, uh, you know, more in detailed uh, suggestions and have meetings with them and so forth. And all the meetings were open, uh, and uh, now, uh, after the parliament got it, they finalized it, the parliament got the new constitution, uh, and we actually translated it to English, so people can read the new stuff in it, uh, and what sort of nation we want to be. <laughs> uh, and I'm actually proud to be a part of that nation that is represented in that text. Um, for we have many uh, improvements uh, in relation to direct democracy and so forth. We're talking about can we govern ourselves. Uh, and I uh, what, the, what kind of things uh, were people asking for, Birgitta? What, what, I mean, people, so the door was open for people to kind of rewrite their own constitution. What kind of pe things were people asking for? What was unique that they were saying? Well, um, they were asking for uh, a new kind of access to the parliament, for example. So uh, uh, now the Parliament actually has is uh, obliged to open its door to the people. If like 10% of the nation wants to put forward a bill, uh, it can. Uh, and uh, and that means that if there are some things that are not included in the constitution, for example, 10% of the nation can uh, come together, uh, put forward a petition, uh, and bring a bill into the parliament. This is uh, similar like in the Swiss parliament, which are probably the most advanced uh, direct democracy uh, society in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, also 10% can call for national referendum. Uh, and 
there were lots of people, and there are many people still that want to uh, make the barrier much higher, uh, like 25 percent and, and so forth. Uh, we included animal rights. We included third generation of freedom of information. Uh, we included ah, yes. the right to uh, internet access. Uh, we included uh, protection for whistleblowers and uh, source protection. Uh, we included, of course, one of the most important ones, and that is that our natural assets remain in the ownership of the nation. Uh, and just lots of good stuff. Awesome. I'd like to go uh, across to Nomi. Uh, we, we couldn't get your sound earlier. We were talking about where these ideas originally came from. The, there was a lot of frustration around at the time that the Occupy movement started. Mm -hmm. What do you think people were responding to when uh, Occupy kicked off? Well, it's a number of things. I mean, as you said in your introduction, Occupy wouldn't have happened without. Not only did it show the injustice, it showed the difference in the work and the people who were in charge who really didn't, really didn't know what they were doing. Didn't see it coming. Uh, we still, no, me. I'm really sorry. We still have um, problems with with your sound. Uh, I'd like to go to Gavin, if possible, because uh, Begita. One of the things that Begita mentioned that w was wanted to be pushed through was this idea about. The removal of central banks. Now, this, uh, in fact, I think it was today or this week, certainly, Bloomberg had a story that suggested that uh, Bitcoin was posing a threat to central banks. The, um, could you, because many people at home won't know what Bitcoin is, and I know it's difficult, but could you perhaps succinctly explain what Bitcoin is and what its purpose really is in this world? Sure. Um, I think of Bitcoin as open source money or cash for the internet. So what it really is, it's a, it's a four-year-old project to create a new kind of money for our new internet-connected world. Um, so it's an open source software project that has some software that processes payment transactions. Um, and it is this digital currency called Bitcoin that has a, a limited supply that um, has no single person in control everybody who is using bitcoins are the people who are, are supporting the network and are helping um, create it and make it grow and make it prosper so it's really a kind of a, a, a reboot on how you do money and what makes it different to the way current central banks work? Bloomberg were concerned that it was a threat to central banks how is it different to a central bank? well it really takes the power away from kind of elite bankers and gives it back to the people who are actually using the currency. I mean, which, if you think about it, I mean, when money first started, um, money was that way, and that we used things that were rare uh, as money. So gold became a very popular money. Um, before that, people would use seashells, rare seashells, for example, as money that they would trade. Um, and so, you know, if you think way back, um, there were no central banks. You know, if you wanted more seashells, you had to go out and find them, and they were valuable because they were rare. Uh, Bitcoin kind of harkens back to that and kind of gives power back to the people in that you know, there is no central bank issuing the currency. There's no central organization who's processing all the transactions. All of that's happening peer-to-peer -peer over the Internet. And is it that kind of transparency that you think is drawing people towards it because its value has... Uh, has increased over the last year or so? Its value really has increased. Um, well, I think, you know, any new technology, um, you know, Birgitta said, you know, they're experimenting with direct democracy in Iceland. I, I still tell people Bitcoin is still an experiment because we haven't had this kind of money before. Um, but as the experiment shows that it's successful, as we show that you actually can make a system like this work, um, people get more and more confident in it, and more and more people are deciding that um, you know Bitcoin is worth trying. Um, it's incredibly convenient to pay somebody all the way on the other side of the world instantly, basically with Bitcoin. It, it's it's just you know once you try it and um, see how easy it is or how easy it can be to use. Um, I think a lot of people are really getting excited about it. I'd like to go to uh, John. John, uh, you're a professor of public policy at the University of Warwick. We've heard of um, a kind of digital d direct democracy had taking place in Iceland, and we've heard from Gavin of a digital currency, Bitcoin. Do you think these kinds of systems can work? We could get John up on the screen. Uh, 
please? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I think the interesting thing about the Iceland case is that it's not just a digital democracy. I mean, some of the things that um, Brigitte was talking about were the the direct occupation of space around the parliament, the, the presence of people out in the streets, the, the demonstration of the scale of, of public anger uh, with the system. And that's exactly the kinds of things that were so valuable about the Occupy movement, was that people were getting out and showing that there were large numbers of people who, who were angry, and they were, they were using physical occupation of space to, to demonstrate that. She was also telling us about the... Um, the formal processes, the, the the selection of representative samples of people, the the, the election of members, the, the the debate that went on within those kinds of forums, and then opening it back out, the experts who were in there advising, the drafters, the lawyers, the constitutional experts, and so forth, and then it gets opened out into these broader digital spaces. To, so to call it a digital democracy in its own right is is kind of misleading because it's not just that. Sure, did you, I mean it's it's a bit like um, the the Arab Spring, right? People talk about this as being the Facebook and the Twitter revolutions, and sure, a great deal of activity was coordinated using those means. But what was it they were coordinating? They were coordinating physical activity, physical displeasure, the recapture of physical space by by ordinary citizens, and and, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. The other thing I wanted to say uh, was about the newness of all this. Um, I was fascinated by the Occupy movement. I, it's such a pity we haven't heard from Naomi yet because um, we're, we're having difficulties. But um, I'd love to talk some more about this because um, I just I found Occupy just so fascinating. I went down to Occupy London. I, there was an Occupy Warwick um, uh, occupation. Spent some time with those people as well, and um, I thought what was fascinating uh, was the was the actual was the physical occupation. What was Sad for me, in a way, was the the fact that this stuff isn't new. It has been done before. Every generation rediscovers these kinds of ideas. They rediscover direct democracy. They rediscover uh, participatory democracy. They rediscover egalitarian principles. And every time it falls over for very, very familiar reasons. And I just think it's sad that, in a way, we keep rediscovering this stuff, but we keep not learning the lessons of the past. We keep not learning from uh, things that happened to the radical feminist movement in the 1970s. We so, so uh, John, what are those reasons? What are those well, reasons? Why do, you, why do you think it fails each time if it continues to crop up throughout subcultures throughout history? Because the, I mean, it's partly to do with structures, right? So one of the one of the key things about the Occupy movement is that they put a lot of emphasis on. Um, not have on having process, but not having a program. You, you mentioned in your in your introduction that it was um, it was clear that they were angry, but it wasn't clear what they wanted to replace it. Now some of that came out, um, but early on it was it was hard because the the very open um, uh, non hierarchical non leadership um, daily debate thing was very hard. Um, for outsiders looking in to, uh, to to look at it and say, "All oh, right, okay, that's what they're advocating. That's what they want to replace this with. That's what they want to uh, to change about it." It was very hard for an outsider, for for a media organisation, even even for the internet, to get hold of that and and say, "Okay, there's this program for change." And and when you end up with those kinds of things, it inevitably falls apart because oh, I mean, I can talk a lot about the way that. The, that some of the radical feminist movement fell apart um, because of the way that high... Uh, no, sorry, I think we've lost your sound there. Jo John, sorry. Uh, we could go to Nomi. Hopefully, maybe you fixed the, the microphone problems, I hope. Is this what any you better? Of that, if you heard any of that? Is this any better? Can you hear me now? Uh, we can. It's, it's okay. kind of tinny, yes, but let's go ahead. Okay, sorry. It's probably the internet connection. Um, Oh, I'm so sorry, Nomi. The sound is still mm. is still not right. Maybe try um, if I could make a quick suggestion. Try sure. unplugging the headset and using the microphone on your laptop. I'd like to go to Mark Johnson just to keep the conversation moving. But we, I really do want to speak to you, Nomi. So uh, please don't, don't leave us. 
Mark, what do you make of all this? You're from The Economist, you, you write about technology, politics, international affairs. Are we not seeing a watermark moment where perhaps the subcultures that are trying to make these changes have a new thing, a new trick in their pocket, which is digital technology? Surely that's something that other uh, previous cultures that have tried this have not had. Well, we've heard some very inspiring stories uh, this evening, and uh, I think I probably just ought to sound maybe a note of caution uh, on what we've heard. Um, Iceland is a fascinating story and a fascinating place. I've been there, and it's a beautiful place, and the people are lovely. But uh, it's important to remember that it's a very small example. Iceland's about the size of a, a big British city, just one British city, uh, and it's easy to do very special things in small places like that. It's a great place to experiment and to look at, but it's not necessarily true that those things will work in places with more complex political systems. And uh, Bitcoin as well. We're absolutely fascinated by Bitcoin here at The Economist. We love finance and we love technology. This marries both of them. Uh, the other great thing about Bitcoin is it's got these great foundation myths. It was uh, allegedly created by this shadowy founder called um, Satoshi Nakamoto, who may or may not actually be a real person. That kind of stuff is catnip to journalists like me. Uh, but there's also a sense in which Bitcoin is anti-democratic in some ways. Uh, it's almost rule by the geeks. Uh, anybody who tries hard can ultimately pick up what's going on in the back of the in the financial uh, papers. You can understand that if you put a bit of effort into it. It's very hard for anybody who doesn't come from that kind of geeky background to get to the grips of what makes um, uh, Bitcoin work and to, to make sure that it it, it keeps working in the way that we've been promised it will. Um, financial policy and monetary policy is a, a sort of lever that many politicians have. If they wield it correctly, it's a lever that they can use to make life better for all of their citizens. And what's good for one country is not necessarily good for another country. So there's a sense in which um, these kinds of new schemes are definitely worth watching, but uh, we must be careful to make sure that we don't lose democracy in this process rather than... Um, uh, instead of instead of creating it, which is what we, we hope to do. Some uh, good points there. There's two things I want to pick up on in that because they kind of tie in with some comments and questions we've had. I'd like to first go to Begitta about um, uh, what you said about the size of the country. We have a comment here which ties into what you said. It's from Marianne Points on YouTube and a few other people have agreed with this question. She said, can other countries larger than Iceland peacefully take over our own country, say in the United States or Iceland? Or was Iceland successful because the country was so small? And she's from Repeace International and Occupy Wall Street. So, Birgitta, ultimately, c could this system that you've implemented in Iceland be implicated in somewhere like the United States or perhaps a country in Europe? Okay. Uh, I have thought a lot about it, uh, and I think it is uh, a yes and a no to it. Like, one of the good things we Icelanders have is that we don't have a military and our police doesn't wear guns. And it's not a wow. tradition for the general public public to use guns. So it's uh, relatively easier for us to have a peaceful uh, revolution uh, because of that culture of uh, peaceful protests and so forth. Uh, but what I've been thinking so much about is that, okay, so Iceland is small, but we still have all the same complexities in our systems as any other nation. Uh, they're just, uh, you, you have an easier time in reaching uh, critical mass about an idea. Uh, so I think it proves to me that our systems have become too big. They have become too big in Iceland, in our little system. Uh, it has all the same problems of people falling through the holes in the system and the system defending itself and, and just becoming completely self-serving. Uh, and it, it shows that we need to use the technology that we already have at hand and in many ways uh, the pirates from around the world, the pirate parties, have been trying to address this. And thus, they created something called liquid democracy, which uh, is a really brilliant system in uh, incorporating and getting people to, to be involved in their societies. This is all about that. It is the question about getting people to care enough about the democracy to put some effort and to understand with all the freedoms we want to have, there is the responsibility of actually taking and making decisions. The reasons why we have faulty systems uh, is because people don't have access, they don't know how the system works, and this is the only reason I decided to go into the system to understand how it works. Just like as a, a computer expert or an analyst uh, or a geek, I would 
go inside my computer system and try to understand how it works in order to improve it if my computer was messed up. Uh, so we need to downgrade our systems, not downgrade them, we need to install a new system and actually a new hardware. And I think uh, I have talked to a lot of political analysts and I think it is important to know that uh, we have an information revolution and people are recognizing that they have the right to know what their governments are doing. Uh, and that's why Wikileaks played such an important role. Uh, and what do we do with this information? How do we keep uh, the people we trust to look after our interests honest? We have direct access to them. And thus we have the representative parliaments uh, with direct democracy and ultimately the idea would be that then they would become redundant and we don't need to have them there as a, a career politicians who just elect people every four years uh, or something like that to uh, uh, look after uh, our interests within the structure if we need that to carry on with that uh, sort of parliamentary structure. I think we're outgrowing that system and that is why it is different now. We have had a very long tradition of uh, representative parliaments that have become sort of like the things that it uh, uh, grew out of, and that is dictatorship of kings and popes. Can I just come in on that, that? Dan? Is, is technology, is technology uh, making government kind of obsolete? Shouldn't we be moving quicker now that we have all these technologies at hand? Are you asking me? Or who are you asking? No, Mark, sorry. I was after yeah. Mark. Yeah. If you could yeah. maybe answer, answer the, the points that begin to raise there. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think technology is making government obsolete. I think technology offers us a big opportunity to make our current systems work much better. And sometimes that's very simple ways. Actually, that's things like um, making it easier for citizens themselves to become more informed about political issues. So in the past, citizens uh, had really to listen to special interest groups. They had to listen to politicians, or they had to listen to big businesses, or they had to listen to trade unions, and those are the people from whom they got their stories. These days, through um, newspapers and magazines, and especially through social media, citizens can sort of make their own mind up and get more involved in the debate, and I think that makes existing political debate better. And uh, also, I think that, um, I mean, I'm glad that liquid feedback's been raised because that's a fascinating system. This is a, a way of using a, a clever piece of technology that's been well thought through to uh, influence the politics of a party. So to encourage a leader to take a certain line which has come from the grassroots. But what it doesn't try to do is say we don't need those leaders, we don't need parliamentary democracy, we don't need parties. Because often if you just tell people that they uh, should just yell for what they want, then um, people often call for very popular things, things that seem good, but they, they find it harder to, um, and, and Birgitta I'm sure will say differently, but they find it hard to make tough decisions. Um, it's hard when there's no party political system for a prime minister or a, a, a president to make those tough decisions to have the loyalty for people to stand by him. And the place that we see uh, this idea of direct democracy happen most is, uh, well, Switzerland is one and California is another. Uh, in Switzerland, one of the problems is that there are so many elections that lots of Swiss people are losing their interest in voting altogether. And in California, the problem is that um, there's too many conflicting uh, laws being created by the citizens there. People there um, have voted and introduced laws that both force the government to increase public spending and force them to decrease uh, the levels of tax. And obviously the result of that is um, uh, financial mismanagement. And uh, those are the sort of issues that we have to deal with if we really are serious about um, moving democracy along in a bigger way than just making our current systems more effective. John, did you have something to say? I, I heard you yeah. speaking earlier about some of the things yeah, that the was mentioning. Things. Yeah, I mean, I think to a certain extent, I uh, think this, the size issue is, is is a red herring. I think that um, these these technologies um, can work uh, at reasonably large scale. They can um, uh, work very effectively to channel um, people's uh, ideas and preferences and, and experiences of politics into a, into a system. But you still, as Mark said, you still need a system to channel it into. You still need um, representative structures in some way or another which, which sort through competing claims, which, which make all things considered judgments. I don't think that ordinary people are, are not capable of doing those things. I just think that we live busy lives and we, we, we 
choose to devote our energies to certain kinds of things and not others. I think that's then why the, the Iceland situation is so interesting, is because it, it's, a, it's a unique moment. It, this is not about politics as usual. This is about the constitution. This is about the background rules of a society. And so in, when you're talking about something like that, it's, it's relatively easy to motivate people um, in quite large numbers to get involved. It, and this has been done, again, there is history here. There is um, the British Columbian Citizens Assembly re redoing their electoral system. I'm attempting to. Um, there have been lots of other um, large-scale direct citizen involvement in, in redesigning systems. When then you move on to day-to-day -to -day politics, to decision-making as usual, um, in South America through participating budgeting and things like that, the numbers always start to drop um, and and that then starts to undermine people's sense of the legitimacy of these things. Now, in my view, that's that's overstated. You know, we shouldn't worry too much if people don't feel the need to get involved in every single decision, but, but that's the perception that comes in, uh, about. So, you know, again, I think that these things, is, they're great, but they're add-ons. They're fantastic and they're, they're valuable but they're not the system itself. They're, we can't replace the system with these kinds of, of innovations. We can, we can improve the system, we can enhance the system, but, but the system is the way it is for very good reasons. And let's uh, read out some comments we've got through uh, on YouTube here. We have, uh, and I'll come to you, Birgitta, after I've just read some of these out, and then I want to go to Gavin to, to respond to some things that Mark said earlier. From Love Block on YouTube, he said, the criminals who brought the world economy to its knees get taxpayers' money. The taxpayer pays for the banksters' losses. That's some democracy there. Um, uh, so, yeah, begin to what, what was your, your, question, your point that you wanted to raise? Okay, uh, well, I actually want to respond to that, uh, exactly that, because we just had an incredible uh, ruling by the ESA court. Uh, the the uh, Dutch and the UK government took Iceland to the ESA court. Uh, yes. with the help from the EU to uh, try to actually have us pay interest, very high interest, on uh, private money from the banks uh, on, like, to socialize the private debt that uh, the nation had nothing to do with. Uh, and we managed to um, uh, actually stop it uh, by, or well, some weird stuff happening <laughs> on the channel. <laughs> Anyway, so we managed to stop it uh, through a couple of national referendums, uh, the first referendums ever in our history, uh, called by the people of Iceland. Uh, we took a huge risk, uh, and to our great delight, we actually were right about it. It was good to get to a court and get the final uh, verdict on it, uh, and it was in the favor of the Icelandic nation, because it would have been very difficult for them to say, uh, uh, to rule against us because that would have meant that every nation in the EU, uh, EU uh, would be responsible for their private banks if they would collapse, which is of course... Uh, can, I, can I just try and clarify that story, Birgitta? Is it, yeah. Uh, I think Birgitta is talking about the ICE safe uh, story in which UK depositors lost a lot of money to Icelandic banks when they collapsed. And did One I hear you say that... Uh, you, Icelandic bank, yeah. One uh, specific go, Icelandic yeah. bank. And did you say that you used referendums to push through a policy to say that you wouldn't pay that money yes. back that had been lost by a private uh, bank? Yes, yes, we did, actually. So, uh, so it was a form of, of direct democracy having a big impact, I guess. Oh, yeah, very big. Uh, and uh, a huge fight. It was the biggest fight in the history of the parliament as well. We did try to hammer out a reasonable agreement with the UK and the, and the uh, Dutch uh, government, uh, but... Uh, I guess they have not forgotten their colonist uh, sort of tactics and, and they actually, to be frank, treated us in a really uh, dis horrifying way and plus the UK of course put the terrorist law on us uh, which meant that we were facing a, a very serious crisis in the wake of the financial collapse uh, where food and medicine shortages were uh, starting to occur. But anyway, I just wanted to talk about the other stuff uh, that uh, because we are experimenting with uh, one of the, the chief architects for liquid democracy actually comes from Iceland. Uh, uh, his name is Moira McCarthy uh, and he's one of the pirates. And um, uh, he has developed a system uh, like the Icelandic version of liquid democracy. And we are actually creating our policy in a very, uh, in a very interesting way. And, uh, sorry about that sound. Did you just, just carry on, Birgitta, sorry. Yeah. 
Okay, so so we are trying to uh, develop uh, like our policy through the liquid uh, de democracy uh, platform, uh, and so um, we're not only thinking of it as a platform for you know uh, other pirates to influence others that are inside parliament. It's not only about that, but to actually get people to participate and have influence on uh, ongoing policies work and uh, we are also doing experimentation uh, which I sort of brought in from my own political moment uh, where we have horizontal uh, structures and no leadership um, which has worked really well for us uh, for the, the near full term in the parliament uh, and it takes away this uh, and it's actually confused everybody a lot in Iceland uh, the media and uh, my fellow uh, parliamentarians uh, and, uh, uh, and all the people in the embassies and so forth and uh, we also experimented with uh, something else, and that is not to define ourselves left or right, uh, or in minority or majority. So we only focus on agenda. So we sometimes support the government, like with the constitution. Sometimes we support the mi other minority, like with ISAVE. Uh, and sometimes we don't support anybody. Uh, and our main goal was actually to just get normal people inside the parliament that were not trained and bred in the political parties, so that we would have a true representative uh, elements inside this place of uh, uh, representatives. Plus another. If we could go to uh, Birgitta, if we could go to uh, Gavin. Uh, yes, we were sorry. talking about access to li liquid. Uh, access to, uh, ac sorry, access to liquid democracy platforms. And earlier, Mark Johnson said that platforms like Bitcoin, which was another digital platform, kind of replacing uh, old established ideas, is the preserve of the geeks. It isn't a democratic system because only geeks really can understand it. Do you think that's a fair, fair assessment of Bitcoin? Um, um, on a certain level, maybe. Um, but then again, I mean, you know, the value of Bitcoin really comes from everybody who's using it. And it's not just geeks who are using it. So, um, you know, as, as if people stop using it, it loses value for everybody. The more people who use it, you get these neat network effects that just make it more and more valuable. Um, I just want to pop back because um, just thinking about direct democracy, I actually have some personal experience with direct democracy because I live in a, a part of New England that for the last few hundred years has, has this institution called Town Meeting, which is a direct democracy um, where the people in the town, we govern ourselves. And I'm actually a member of Amherst Town Meeting, the town I live in. Um, and so I can, I can see you know, how it, it, it mostly works at a local level, but once you do get past a certain scale, it, it starts to not work. So I do think there, is a, there are some scale problems. Thinking about technology on the internet, um, you know, I think we really have to think about what types of things that government had to do in the past because you know you can't scale up, does the internet enable? And I think there are some things. I, I've got to disagree with Mark. I think there are some things that government has done in the past that it had to do just because of the scaling problems. But I think you know, as as we have this technology for anybody communicating with anybody else instantly, uh, we have technologies for aggregating opinions. We have you know all these other interesting new technologies. I do think that it's time to rethink some of the things that government has done in the past because government doesn't have to do them anymore. I mean, maybe government should still do them, but I think we, we're getting technologies where we can rethink it, and maybe we should. I'd like to read out some comments. Thanks for that, that, that Gavin. That's great. I'd like to read out some comments. I've got one here from Bjorn Gunnarsson who says that technology won't make government obsolete. It will completely revolutionize in a way that the end result will look nothing like the government of before. Um, I have a point here from Michelle Rennie Orth who says, does John really think that the feminist movement was a failure? Movements like evolution happen in burst, it's not a failure. Uh, I'd like you to answer that one, John. Perhaps we'll save that for another debate. Um, and we also have a point here to say, where people are asking the question, Snack M, I can't read this name, these names, Snack M4N, or Snack Man probably, I'm still curious to hear the participants' opinions on the use of video recording devices to replace or augment the police force. Again, that's a really interesting point, but perhaps another, uh, one for another debate. Um, I'd like to just go to you all uh, one last time and kind of 
consider what we might expect the future of these technologies will be. So if we could perhaps start with Begitta. Um, in the future, do you think that we will begin to see more and more digital platforms replacing elements of government? And do you think that's a good thing? Uh, I, th I think that uh, you know, the more participation we have with the general public uh, in co-creating their societies, it's better. I, I, I don't think we're going to see governments vanish in the next you know, few decades. Uh, and I, I think that uh, as we're just, we are doing so many new things because we have all these possibilities of sharing knowledge, of sharing experience, uh, and uh, to do it actually quite quickly. And with the liquid democracy, I, I just want to explain it really quickly how it works. And I think yeah. it's so brilliant. Uh, is that, okay, so let's say I know that you are an expert in uh, media law, and you know that I'm an expert in uh, freedom of expression law or whatever. And uh, so I entrust you for my vote in everything on that issue, and you entrust me for your vote uh, in everything yeah. in that uh, aspect. However, if, you, if I start to think, Jesus, he's just completely lost it, uh, I don't trust him anymore, then I can revoke my vote and vice versa. And this you can't do with governments. You have to sit with them, like you have to live with them for four years uh, or more. Uh, even if they do terrible mistakes. So this could be a really good way to move liquid democracy into Parliament, and that is my dream. Mark Johnson, what do you make of that? That seems a fair enough point. Why should we live with governments for four years uh, when we can have a much quicker, fluid and liquid system that Begitta has described? Mark? Uh, Sorry, I apologise. I had muted myself out of politeness. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was okay. Intently. No, um, as I've said before, I actually think the, the liquid feedback system is a fascinating one and I'd like to learn more about it and find out where it's going. Um, I just think we need to be careful and we need to remember that um, in politics sometimes the, the, the best strategies for governments are the thought out ones with lots of interlinking policies that all try and achieve one goal together. And if you try and pick and choose a la carte from what you like and what you don't like, then sometimes you find you don't get where you want to go in the end. And that's a slightly cryptic way of saying, be careful what you wish for. Uh, but there's no doubt that technology is already and will continue to make politicians more accountable and make the voices of, of ordinary people louder all the time. And that's only a good thing for the societies that we live in. Uh, Gavin, if we could go to you. You're, you're coming at this specifically from the angle of finance and banks. How do you think the digital technologies such as Bitcoin will change or perhaps even revolutionize uh, the way we finance our planet? Uh, well, the short answer is I don't really know. And I don't think anybody really knows. Um, I think it has the potential to, to really be huge. I think it has the potential to, you know, make government finances more transparent, um, to, you know, take power away from, you know, bankers and other kind of you know elites that, that control things now but then again you know maybe that won't happen maybe they will adapt I mean I think governments in the past uh, have shown they're very capable of adapting to new technologies and and they do and they will um, so you know if, if you ask me to bet I would guess that 20 30 40 50 years from now government will look pretty much the same as it is now and uh, you know I don't think the no. power structure is going to change I, I, <laughs> I might be wrong, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that uh, that they will adapt. John, what do you make of that? Will governments adapt to all these rapidly changing uh, digital platforms? Yes, I think um, governments will adapt, but I also think that the usual suspects will adapt as well. I think that a lot of these systems... Um, are put in place, you know, participatory systems, participatory democracy is put in place for really good reasons, to, to try to empower ordinary people. But the people they actually end up empowering are often the time rich. And I'm interested in making sure that it's not just the time rich who gets a voice in politics, but the time poor as well. People who have caring duties, people who, are, who might be disabled, people who are, people who have um, busy jobs, working class people. I want to make sure that those people have a voice as well. And sometimes those people are better integrated into a political system and have more power through representative and party structures than they do through 
the, 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 the more participatory mechanisms. And we see that from the progressives at the beginning of the, of the 20th century through to um, workers' cooperatives, through to the radical feminist movement, through to Occupy. Uh, and I wish, I, I, I love this stuff, but I wish that people would, would learn some of these lessons from history and modify their processes in order to try and make, you know, make some more progress and not just have it fall flat on its face every time. Thank you very much to all our contributors. I have loved this debate. It's been fascinating. I want to give the final words to the people who make this show happen, which is our viewers. Love Block said, great point, Begitta, which I think he was uh, referring to when you described uh, how direct democracy actually works. Um, we've got one here from Trader Tim, who says he prefers algorithms over the foibles of powerful individuals, which is uh, a view echoed in many online forums. And Someone also, let me just check the, the name of this person, sorry. The Real Plato says that was a very cryptic way of saying the government makes things complicated, in my honest opinion. So thank you to everybody who watched. Thanks for all of the comments. Thank you to all of our contributors. It's been a fascinating debate. Um, I'd just like to point you towards our programming tomorrow. We have Truthloader Investigates live. So if this is the first time you've seen Truthloader, subscribe, tweet about us, Facebook us. Put us on your Google Plus page because we're making awesome content and we're live again tomorrow at 4 p.m. Next week, we're doing a debate about games and whether games are art and whether or not games really do cause people to be violent or not. So stick around for that as well. And we have a, an amazing comments piece coming in on Monday at 4 p.m. We're live every day at 4 p.m. So if you like this debate, and who wouldn't, hit subscribe and you'll see plenty more every single day. Thanks to everyone and uh, we shall see you again. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks, everybody.